and I was just like, one day I was just like, who do you play as? <laughs> he's like, I play as the Germans. I like, you play as the Nazis. Yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah, I play as the Germans. Yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah. okay, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, nice. Yeah, it's like you go to that... I've never been to, but like you go to a World War Two reenactment and like fifty percent of the people are in SS officers. Exactly. Yeah. I guess it's the same with like a Civil War reenacting. Yeah, it? that's so. Yeah. <laughs> the people, have you ever seen Ken Burns's Civil War documentary? No. It's good. It's okay. very good. But the main guy who does a lot of the talking is this guy named Shelby Foote, and he knows everything about like the Civil War to like a savant level degree. But he is like has this thing about the South, like the lost cause, and he's like, well, I know that it wasn't it wasn't necessarily for a good cause, but the average soldier they were fighting for something big, and it's like Shelby, <laughs> my man, I'm sorry, I don't think you know as much as you think you do. I hate to say it, <laughs> whatever. Mm. Speaking of politics, Dan, do yeah. you? Can I ask you something? Do you, you care? Ask. Do you care at all about who the next Tory PM is going to be, <laughs> or do you have any takes? Do, is it like is one different than the other, or have we just reached like, you know? I mean, I mean, uh, I don't have any particularly unique takes. I don't right. think. What have we reached? Uh, we've reached it's the singularity. A, I mean, it's it's the same. I guess it's the same scenario that played out last time and the time before, mm. just to a sort of like slightly more excessive degree. Whereas the the membership of the Conservative Party that's going to choose the next prime minister of this country is the most sort of batshit, ludicrous, <laughs> deranged electorate that you're ever going to find. Yeah. Of like Surrey golf <laughs> club, like I don't know, I don't, know. I don't know. Yeah, ghouls, yeah. Indeed, indeed, indeed. The people who play golf on the field, that yeah. Gerard, Sir Gerard Wynn Stanley, <laughs> was definitely not no, Sir Gerard nobly Wynn Stanley. Occupied, <laughs> nobly occupied, planted broad <laughs> um, But I, I think there's, an, there's, an, there's another level of thing going on whereby the, you've got the reality of that. The like the they're the lunatic right wing <laughs> lunatic fringe, and then. Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak are competing to yeah. not even to play to them, to, but to play to some kind of even more deranged <laughs> lunatic Christ. fantasy of what the Tory electorate is about, you know, Pl plus with this sort of heavy injection of mm. um, sort of derangement that comes from the, the tabloid press. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, uh, like, it's one of those, like, you, you would have thought, given the centrality of suppose quote unquote like concerns around <laughs> i don't know um the sort of threat to our civilization that's posed by a, a small number of transgender people yeah exactly the degree to which that seems to be weighing heavily in this you would have thought there was that was some constituency to which that supposed issue yeah was of some significance but my understanding is it's not even particularly significant to yeah. Tory party members, you know? Yeah, it's I like... know. It's like they're talking it into existence. And I don't know if that's just, like, it's the same thing in everywhere. It's the same thing in America. And I don't know if they're just talking these culture war things into existence so that they have stuff to talk about or if they're really, like, they believe that these are issues for people. Because it's like, like the bathroom thing in America. Everybody was like, ah, the bathrooms, the bathrooms. And it's like, nobody actually really cares. Like, unisex bathrooms have been around forever, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah I don't know what yeah. the fuck. Yeah, I was on holiday this weekend and there was a, there was a, uh, some toilets on, on a, like a block of toilets at a beach mm. and they were just all unisex yeah just yeah like... why not <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah oh i can't use that bathroom that's the gendered bathroom yeah. it's like okay yeah use the gendered bathroom all right but, yeah but that, i mean the but the the substantive difference between the two of them seems to come down to rishi sunak being quite fiscally conservative and wanting to pay down the debt that was accrued by the nation yeah, as yeah. a result of all of the mitigations for mm. covid that were put in place mm. and liz yeah. truss is just like we don't have to worry about that debt mm. we could we can we can we could she, she, she talks about using treating it as a war debt and okay. we'll just pay it off over decades and rather than do that what we will do is because Rishi Junet wants to raise taxes mm. to pay off the debt and liz truss is just like no that debt doesn't matter mm. and so we're gonna use um we're gonna grow the public debt in order to fun tax cuts okay which Liz is being taken very seriously now that it's a conservative party person saying it sure. when it was the labor party yeah. five years ago saying that the debt doesn't matter <coughs> and we can borrow to invest yeah everybody was like this is madness yeah. but as soon as it's one of the tories talking about it it's um one of the blue people yeah so that's that's i, I like i mean my di my distance and my degree of concern and care i suppose for <laughs> the Labour Party and its fortunes 
um, ebbs and flows. Sure. And I am quite easily roused to a degree of extreme annoyance and frustration mm. with some of these hypocrisies and sort of have to remind myself that, like, uh, you're not actually that invested. You don't care that much. It's mm. not actually that important. Yeah. Um, but it's very easy to feel, like, incredibly hard done by and wronged yeah, of course. by the national media and the current leadership of the Labour Party. Yeah. So I'm constantly in this bind of, like, do I care? Don't I care? Am I uh, outraged? Or <laughs> is it entirely to be expected? Or when will they collect the bins, etc.? Et yeah, I don't know. I mean, I had a, I had a actually engaged, I actually had some kind of engagement with the Labour Party a few weeks ago because oh, yeah. it was um, they were doing the trigger ballot process for our local mm. Labour MP. So basically deciding whether there would be a contest or whether she would be automatically... She was automatically reselected as the Labour Party MP. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, but it, yeah, in my, in my local ward, the number of people at the meeting was like 19. <laughs> okay. <all laughs> so right. it was just like... Fair enough. It would be so easy to organise <laughs> to win these things. And the vote was like, yeah. I don't know, eight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Something. Liz Truss, uh -huh. MMT icon. Really? MMT? Or MTT? MMT. Modern monetary theory. Modern monetary theory icon. Uh, yeah, icon. Oh, okay, icon because she doesn't left. care about the national debt. Yeah, she exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, she's, yeah, she's, employing, <laughs> she's employing MMT principles to um, build a rhetoric around the benefits of tax cuts. Yeah, exactly. Um, we're gonna, screw over we're the gonna, we're gonna, We're going to get out of this potential recession. We're mm. going to bring back growth. We're going to end... Inflation We're gonna with do the it. panacea, <laughs> the well-proven political panacea of tax cuts across yeah. the board, i.e. Mm. to the mega rich. I don't know. Tell you what, after this week's reading... So I think the answer is no. It's okay. inconsequential. It is inconsequential. <laughs> and we shouldn't worry about it. It is. I would say Although in... there is a lot of discussion about the possibility of Liz Truss doing something so stupid that she brings about World War Three because Classic. Um, some of her foreign policy takes um, seem quite dangerous. I mean, foreign policy, I don't know. I don't know. All of the, I, yeah, I don't know. What are you going to do? I will say after this week's reading, I, uh, I think we should go back to the gold standard. Dan, that's my take on everything. So I am now uh -huh. a federalist. Okay. <laughs> um, you mean you weren't on the side of the people calling for paper <laughs> money? No, okay. Paper money, scoff. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Anything else to say on the world? Um, probably not. I did just have a realization. I don't know why I had this so late. The next American election for the president, it's going to be a fucking shit show, dude. Because uh -huh. it's like, it's either going to be Trump again, which would be hilarious. And it would be like everyone being like, but January 6th. And then like some knucklehead. What is it that they always say? American elections, you usually every four years, you get to decide between an idiot and a psychopath. It would be the same thing again, of course, as it always is. Or it's going to be someone who's like more insane than Trump, which I don't even know what that is. I don't like, how do you look up there? <laughs> I thought that after Bush and then so they gave us Trump. So what you're telling me is so. if... if um, Donald Trump gets selected as a Republican Party <laughs> candidate, I should be relieved. Yes, <laughs> exactly. You should be very relieved. All right. Mm. All right. We'll see. Well, I, You know what my, my hot take on everything is? Bush, meaning W, funny. McCain, not funny. Everyone kind of like in between, not very funny. Trump, funny. funny. So the next person that they get, they this have This is like the funny. not bald, bald thing about <laughs> Russian leaders. Yeah, exactly. you, you, you. <laughs> Funny, not funny. Funny, not funny, American president. Yeah. I will Bill say... Clinton. Bill Clinton. Yeah, not funny. Well, no, it's a funny thing. It's playing the saxophone, you know, having to resign. It's very funny. Um, Obama, not funny. But Obama got elected twice. What are you going to do? Um, American politics, oh, you, Dan. Yeah, yeah. Republican candidates, not, not yeah. presidents. Sorry, I forgot yeah. what you were saying. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, I don't know if DeSantis is funny. Doesn't seem like a very funny guy. So. <laughs> I've uh, not come across this character yet, so yeah, I, they're all yeah. scum. Yeah. It's yeah. I mean, I, again, I'm not going to say it's inconsequential, but like, uh, just making yourself care is just so taxing and so depressing. And if you follow all of this stuff, it's just fucking. Oh my god, I don't know. I don't want to sound like an anarchist or something, but like maybe just focus on what's going on around you in your local zone and try not to be like Trump said this thing that was horrible again. Oh my God, I'm going to be stressed out for like eight days now. You know what I mean? It's like these people are going to be who they are regardless of whether or not we read the news. Stay informed, but also like, do you need to keep up on everything? Probably not. You know what I mean? So what are you going to do? But you know what we should all keep informed on, Dan? Things that happened about 250 years ago. That <laughs> <laughs> should be the strap line of this podcast, and it would be if it was a bit more pithy, but yeah, exactly. we'll, we'll work on it. We'll work on it. Um, this week, Dan, we read a whole book. Mm, uh, sort of. Hold for applause. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We skimmed through a whole book. Um, this one, I think I came across first through some, like, 
of the like kind of neo kautzy kind of circles. They talk about this book a lot, it's like specifically the American groups, um, because it is kind of a like study in, well, it's a study in the constitution and maybe can inform some of the stuff that you can concretely do with like political organizing in the vein of Babel and Kautsky and all those guys. Anyway, we read an economic interpretation of the constitution of the United States by Charles A. Beard. Um, it was very good. What it is, is it's kind of like an economic determinist history of the writing of the Constitution and of the purpose of the Constitution. Um, it was written in 1913, so we're getting everything up to date. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of funny because this, it's relatively short. My copy is only about 160 pages. It was riddled with typos. I don't know if you Yeah, mine was like loads <laughs> yeah, of typos. I don't know what the deal yeah, with yeah, that yeah, was. Yeah. But um, it's kind of considered, I think, to be even still one of the like few, I might be talking out of my ass, but like few economic determinist histories of the Constitution. It's not fully Marxist. You can tell that he's kind of been inspired by some of like Marxian history. He name drops LaSalle at one point, which is kind of funny. Um, but he really doesn't use a whole lot of specifically Marxist terminology. He quotes some of the founding fathers as kind of talking about the proletariat and stuff like this. But um, it, yeah, it isn't, it isn't Marxist really, but it, it's something maybe adjacent and it's useful. Like, yeah, I feel like it was almost written upon... There's an interesting disparity between the preface that was in my book, which was mm. written in like 1925, 26, I think, or maybe even later, and uh, the rest of the text, which, as you say, was written in 1913. And I feel like almost in 1913, mm. like Marxism wasn't as like contentious. Of, obviously, he wasn't a Marxist and he was... A, I don't know. But like... <laughs> a guy. To be compared with sort of have or to be seen to be having a sort of like economically determinist line of thinking didn't automatically tar you i suppose or like, yeah either whether it's his innocence or the innocence of the age or just that yeah. that wasn't a particularly significant political cleavage at that point in time kind of thing well, it's so kind of yeah it's yeah. quite interesting it exists in an interesting time period where he was able to write this book maybe that's why it's still like maybe a seminal text maybe the only one that exists of its sort. Mm. i don't really know i didn't do the research <laughs> like because it was in this it's just strange period where it was possible to write an academic text assessing yeah. the U.S. Constitution and the degree to which it was entirely brought about by the economic interests of the people that wrote it and the people that voted for it. Yeah. Well, he has, at the very beginning, he kind of gives us a clue about that because in the preface that I have, he's like, you when you're studying the Revolutionary War and the Constitution and the Founding Fathers, et cetera, et cetera, you usually come across two main streams of historical thought. And one of them is basically just like the great man theory of history. These people do great things, that even if they were divinely inspired wow and then the other one he's like or the teutonic theory of history it's like oh i don't yeah that's thankfully that's one that has fallen out of favor but that's the time that he's writing this book in so he's and he is he's he's basically like this is very cursory someone he says throughout the book someone's going to need to do a lot more work to make this like actually you know an actual work of historical work we actually go through all the records etc cetera, etc cetera. but um it's cursory, but it's also, it makes sense mm. and common yeah, sense. Yeah, I think he, I think he, just coming back to this sort of question of Marxism for a minute, I think he has a kind of like quite lay understanding of what Marxism is. But mm. in the preface that I read, he was the, he was very much like, I was much more sympathetic to Marx when I realized the things that he was saying actually had their analogs in, well, that Marx was actually like classically trained in philosophy and sort of Greek philosophy oh, and this kind of this stuff. Preface. Yeah, maybe it's because this, I think this was edition was a bit later kind of thing. Okay. Um, and then he also says that like, also he, when he realized that a lot of the language around class and class cleavage is dictating political outcomes was already identified by like James Madison and sort of, um, <sighs> And what's the guy with the, the Hamilton Hamilton yeah. and this kind of thing? He was a bit more like, oh, I was very sympathetic to Mark wants to realize that his ideas actually were just a reflection and continuation of mm. all of the people he'd already identified as his sort of like, not political heroes necessarily, but the yeah. sort of academic history that he was familiar with, whether it was Greek philosophy or yeah. uh, the constitutional framers in the United States kind of thing. So. Mm. And engaging with all of that stuff too, and like actively seeing himself as mm. like a process, like a part of this whole but It's interesting that there, it was a period of time where it was possible to like, openly fit mm. marks into yeah. this sort of like continuum of thinkers without yeah. having him be a pariah or having set yourself up as a pariah as a result of identifying marks yeah. as actually existing in a legitimate intellectual tradition I suppose. exactly well it's like when every when everyone brings up like british uh political economists that came before marx like ricardo or adam smith like adam smith is everyone just goes oh the invisible hand of the market guy and it's like oh and marx the labor theory of value guy and it's like oh, <laughs> god damn it um but yeah what are you gonna do it's the same thing with history same thing with philosophy um 
I did find this pretty enlightening. And it's funny because a lot of what he does in this book is just primary source quoting yeah. and just being like, you want, here's my theory. You want to know how I came up with this theory? By just reading what these people said. It's like, wow, history. He's doing it. Um, so yeah, I guess we should talk about what his argument is in this. The last sentence, which I'm going to read because he does an excellent job in this book of doing <laughs> a lot of primary source stuff. And then the last couple paragraphs of every chapter are, here are my conclusions. Boom, 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 boom. And the last page of the entire book is that, but for the whole book. It rocks. Very, very good. We love it when people do that. He just says, the Constitution was not created by the whole people, as the jurists have said. Neither was it this created by the states, as the Southern nullifiers have long contended. But it was the work of a consolidated group whose interests knew no state boundaries and were truly national in their scope. Um, so he's going to basically put forward the argument that um, there were specific economic reasons why the people who wrote the Constitution, first of all, called for a convention to replace the Articles of Confederation, um, that they stood to gain financially literally like immediately after ratification of this new Constitution, and that um, there are pretty clearly class elements to the people who were for it and the people who were against it. And he goes through and he kind of outlines the kind of nuances of these different classes because it becomes pretty apparent early on that he's not just talking about capitalists and he's not just talking about workers. He's being a lot more specific than that. He's saying that there were capitalists who did not stand to gain by this new constitution, who were totally fine under the Articles of Confederation, and the same thing for workers, actually. Like, when we read the Fawner way back, um, we talked about how there actually was a social element to the American Revolution that you might not always think of. You might just think of it as like the bourgeois revolution or whatever. But um, it's a very similar thing here. He's being very nuanced and he's giving you kind of like, yeah, specific examples for who was for it and who wasn't. Yeah, it's definitely like a different arrangement of classes, economic interests that we would recognize, but it's almost like the capitalist and proletarian classes that are the, sort of the hallmark of a Marxist analysis haven't really quite developed yet. And it's also, he, he does do a little job, a little, there is a little portion of the early stages of this book where he lays out people who have no say in this process at all, right? There are a huge number of people who are disenfranchised because mm. we're talking at a time where obviously women couldn't vote, slaves were disenfranchised, obviously, mm. um, but also there were huge or significant property qualifications to be able to vote or to stand for elections kind of thing. So there was a huge swath of people who are propertyless who had no say or whose interests weren't recognized, weren't represented rather around any side of this debate. But then what you do have is a cleavage between various different classes of property owners and people who have various different interests. And you can see within those classes and those interests a sort of the nascent and emerging elements that what would come to represent what we mm. would imagine to be a modern capitalist class, I suppose. And there are industrial interests sort of nestled in this. There are financial interests nestled within it kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's, but it's interesting what he is counterposing his argument to, which is one, I guess, one of the ways in which this book is kind of still prescient is like the argument that he's counterposing it to in a lot of ways is one that I feel like you still get given to you today, which is the founders of the constitution were like, <laughs> like experts in political theory and political mm. economy and they were setting up the perfect political system from that quote that you said designed to like represent the whole people and it was it was founded upon high-minded ideals <laughs> div almost divinely inspired you know this sort of like the the ultimate political text that stood the test of time um and one of the things that i probably should have known already but one of the things that this book has told me is how clearly nonsensical that is and how, in actual fact, the United States is sort of lumbered with this constitution, which was designed to satisfy or to advantage a whole series of political interests mm. of the late 17th century. Yeah. Um, and so, um, I don't know. 18th. <laughs> 18th century. <laughs> no, I was like, yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it is very interesting, and it's funny because he gets into this bit at the beginning where he kind of talks about what is a constitution, and he gives you actually a pretty good, simple, quick, structuralist understanding of a government and, that you know, what a constitution is. Because he kind of talks about, you know, like, the constitution is very cold language. It's very, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, you know, it is cold in its language, and it also just seems very sterile. And if you read it, except for some parts that are just very blatantly, like, not in the favor of the people or the majority at all. It's You wouldn't really necessarily understand what it's trying to do or the purpose of it. And he gives this James Madison quote, which 
two people come across, nobody in this book comes across well, but two people come across like the biggest fucking piece of shit of all time, and it's James Madison. And, and Hamilton. It's <laughs> Hamilton oh, also. Like. I think Hamilton, maybe not Hamilton <laughs> uh -huh. so much as uh, the first chief justice, what was his name, Marshall or whoever. Oh, Real right. fucking piece uh -huh. of shit, that guy. Um, but I'm just going to read a little bit of the Madison quote. Um, Madison, we'll get to why Madison sucks here in a bit, but he basically just says, the common issues... Uh, the, well, okay, so he's talking about how society splits up into different factions and different parties. And he says, uh, the proprietors, this ensues a division of society into different interests and parties. Again, this is fucking riddled with typos, so I'm trying. The most common and durable source of these factions have been the various and unequal distribution of property. Those who hold and those who are without property have ever formed distinct interests in society. Those who are creditors and those who are debtors fall under a like discrimination. A landed interest, a manufacturing interest, a mercantile interest, a moneyed interest, with many lesser interests, grow up of necessity in civilized nations and divide them into different classes, actuated by different sentiments and views. The regulation of these various and interfering interests forms the principal task of modern legislation and involves the spirit of the party and faction and the necessary and ordinary operations of the government. So Madison is literally just coming out and saying all of these different kind of like moneyed interests, capitalist interests, don't work in perfect unison with each other because their interests are always different. And he's like, just put aside the issue of the majority because we just know that, you know, the people with property and people without property, that's the biggest like source of friction in this whole thing. But he's basically saying the reason we need this new constitution and the point of a state in general is to kind of facilitate this friction between these different groups. Obviously, it needs to like day one, put down the majority and make sure that the majority can never take power, meaning just normal people. But then he's also saying that what it needs to do is it needs to kind of come down and kind of like judge in the differences to use kind of more Marxist framing up like words um, between the capitalist like factions in, in the capitalist class. And it's so funny because it's like, that's like on the eighth page and it's just like, oh, oh, so that was the purpose of the constitution. That's why they wrote it. They didn't do it to make this like high-minded, like, you know, prior to the French revolution, this like beautiful revolution where all men are created equal or whatever. He's literally just saying, listen, we're all not getting along very well because, you know, we all have different interests or whatever. So we need someone to adjudicate between all of that and do it in a way that benefits my class more than anyone else. And it's so fucking insane because he quotes another um, letter that Washington I believe Washington is sending Madison where it's in between the ratification of the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution. And he's basically just saying, hey, listen, man, a lot of really highly respectable people are talking about just going back to monarchy because there's like so much bad shit going on. Capitalists can't get along with each other. There's this dude named Daniel Shays throwing shit around in, you know, Massachusetts. And so it's really he paints a picture of this really turbulent time where there's just not a strong enough federal government to adjudicate between the capitalist classes. And that's all he's saying. That's why we need a constitution and a strong federal government is to do that. And it's like, fuck, God damn, why didn't I learn that in school? <laughs> it's really funny. Like his constant refrain throughout this book is to say, the ideal type of research that we could do into this would be to have all of the financial records of all of the people involved and to know exactly what their interests mm. were. But we don't have that. But what we can do is... <laughs> Look at what they actually say. Yeah, <laughs> and what they actually say is entirely what they aim to achieve, which mm. is, as you say, to sort of like to prop up the minoritarian interests of property ownership writ large mm. and to adjudicate between the various different types of property ownership so they could all exist and coexist and make money. thrive together. Mm. And it may well be the case that the Constitution doesn't make any reference to the, the central significance of the economic interests that are causing it to be written. But every other text on this topic written yeah, at the time literally. seems to contain these blatant and open admissions that this is what is going on. Yeah. So it's hilarious that there's this sort of assessment of it as the sort of like pure political text of like uh, political theory, yeah. when really it's just a sort of murky, murky, uh, self-serving uh, yeah, literally. scheme. And say. continues to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder whether we should go through some of these various political interests. Yeah, then, definitely, yeah. Because that's sort of the centrality of his argument is to sort of run through the various different ways in which the, the Articles of Confederation and the state that that's put in place are failing uh, certain uh, propertied persons, uh, men. <laughs> yep, dudes, uh, <laughs> white dudes. And how in various different ways they would be advantaged by the instituting of a much more centralised and stronger 
federated state. And one of the central ones that keeps to run through this and one of the, the things that he spends a lot of time gathering evidence for is the ownership of securities mm. or um, what I take to mean to be like the holding of government debt. Mm. So obviously the Continental Congress and the Continental Army had to fund this war against the British and a lot of people gave funds toward that and um, and also there were all these people who served in the army, obviously, and a lot of them went unpaid for this period of time and they were guaranteed pensions and what have you. And they were all given these credit notes to say, OK, we will pay you back at a certain rate of interest uh, over a certain period of time. Don't ever trust you. that. Yeah. Ever <laughs> that. To fund this war, just take these papers. You'll be able to get more uh, money. And, and all of these sort of credit notes had devalued massively and they'd been traded around. Right. And a lot of people who just needed to get the money had who were poorer had to, had sold them to a people who could afford to accumulate them kind of thing, but they were still devaluing. So there were many, many people in the US that had accumulated all of this government debt effectively, which wasn't being serviced and was being radically devalued. And one of the central hopes was if you had a centralized state, it would actually be willing to service this debt. And also I think um, it's Madison who says that like, we have to service this debt because it's the people who hold this debt who are going to be the people who are going to mm. fund and strengthen the United States once it's put into place kind of thing. So the government that would be created by uh, a new consta constitutional arrangement would necessarily have to service all this debt, uh, all this debt which is held by all of these already rich people who would, who were, who would, who the, the writing of the constitution and its implementation would uh, service to enrich massively it's just like so 20 blatant. fold some of the numbers are like 20 fold sort of like it's so disgusting increases and like yeah i mean it's very funny too because it's like oh i wonder what the economic interests of the people who wanted a strong federal government were and it's like oh the people who held the debt it's yeah. like oh okay <laughs> that's obvious you needed like a whole book to tell you that like yeah, god damn yeah, it because yeah, yeah. he goes through in one of the more okay i just got to get through this and read it points of the book he goes through every single person at the constitutional convention and he's like what were their interests how are they making money and some disgusting percentage of them had securities government bonds basically so he makes this distinction in the capitalist class between real property and personal property and real property is basically just like land and real estate it's like kind of just it you know so like people who have big farm holdings and stuff mainly represented in the south and then um personal property is literally everything else if you're trading in any kind of securities even manufacturing money lending a lot of pieces of shit money lenders in this story um and he says that like in the making of the constitution where personal property was the dynamic element in making the constitution as you're saying like securities and government bonds were the dynamic element of personal property um so he's saying that like hamilton and this is why i kind of like you know hamilton's a piece of shit for doing this but like kind of respect his political like not leanings, obviously, but just like brain is because he didn't have a whole lot of money and he wasn't really like a, he wasn't trading a lot in government bonds. He had a few. He didn't really have that much of a vested financial interest, I think, in the creation of this new federal state. He just had these like ideas about like, I would like to have this federal state. Who can I best organize or who can we best organize to make that happen? And he really clearly saw that it was the owners of personal property. So he was able to say, okay, first of all, it's going to be the people who own government bonds. Duh. If we organize all of them. They have a lot of sway in their respective states. They'll be on board to make this big, strong federal government constitution thing. But then it's also everybody else. It's the manufacturers. It's all of these people. And so he does a lot of very sneaky things to make this happen, um, which we'll get to. But it is very interesting in seeing how he was kind of like the architect behind all of this. And he knew what he was doing. I hate to say it, you know. He can put on a goddamn Broadway play, too. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely set up as being the sort of, like, the mastermind of this mm. whole project. Um, and I guess throughout, we'll get onto it more later on, the sort of, like, political political machinations and the back and forth of the actual ratification of the Constitution and all of the, the hijinks that <laughs> ensued, I suppose. But, like, the sort of, like, the short story is basically that the Federalists were just so much more... Mm well organized they were also much more well funded and actually had sure. like their interests were positively served by a constitution exactly, being put yeah. in place whereas like the anti-federalists weren't actually served by the constitution or the not having a constitution kind of thing exactly, it's like they were yeah. making a negative argument of like rather than a positive one for mm -hmm. something else but like um yeah his his political acumen shines through mm -hmm. 
these pieces of shit. <laughs> it is, yeah, it is super interesting. You're absolutely right. I thought that was something that was really illuminating about this whole process because like federalist and anti-federalist, especially the word anti-federalist is very kind of loose because there are a lot of different people involved in these two different kind of broad categories. Like federalists, just people who were like, yeah, constitution, sure, why not? Big, strong federal government. And the anti-federalists were everyone who, from like people who didn't care but owed money lenders a lot of money, you would probably consider them, like the paper money guys, you'd consider them to be anti-federalists. But you'd also probably consider like some big landholder in the South to be like some kind of anti-federalist. So it's not necessarily like a coherent core of a class that can organize with itself like the federalists are the federalists they knew exactly who they were they were like we literally on day one of the constitution we're going to make a shit ton of money everyone else it was like we just don't want this but we don't really necessarily have anything else to say mm -hmm. and it was funny because in when you're growing up and you learn u.s history you really are taught that like the articles of confederation was this just horrible stupid bad document right but it, he makes the point where he is like other than like the federalists People had problems. Obviously, the paper money people wanted paper money, but it wasn't like they were, like, clambering for a stronger federal government. Like, people were just kind of like, this is okay. We can work through this. So. I mean, I feel like they were being served by all of the flaws that were disadvantaging, yeah, exactly. yeah. disadvantaging the federalists, right? So, I mean, the main the main class of person that might fall into the anti-federalist camp, the one that would be... Um, disadvantaged by the institution of the constitution of the strong state are all of those people who own small parcels of land mm. but are for one reason or another heavily indebted to various money lenders lots of whom are represented in the quote-unquote founding fathers of the united states many yep. of them many of them had lent huge amounts of money to various people and wanted to be secure in the idea that that debt was going to be repaid i suppose mm. and i think also one of the things about the the prospect of having the the state debt be serviced was that the obviously that debt would be serviced by levying taxes and a lot of the taxes would be levied on these sort of like small landowners right yeah. so like all of these small landowners didn't really want to pay debts to a central government that would that those taxes were then going to be paid off to all of these people that they also owed money to because yeah. they were their creditors. Kind of yeah, literally. So that was so that so that's sort of like that's there's two interests encapsulated in that. There's the the agricultural landowners who don't who are sort of like might broadly fall into the anti-federalist camp who have no interest in the the institution of a new constitution, and then there are all these people who are money lenders. Mm. Um, and as we've alluded to several times, there were various movements toward instituting paper money mm. not entirely sure what that's meant to mean other than a money that's not sort of pegged to something so that it can be devalued which yeah. would then result in the devaluing of that debt so it didn't have to be paid back in full or in the same quantity kind of thing yeah and i think there were various bills in various state legislatures designed to do this when we get onto the ratification of the constitution, I think it's Rhode Island that's the last one to ratify. Rhode Island is and <laughs> largely because the dominant party in the Rhode Island legislature was the a populist party that mm. was in favor of paper money. Um, and the, the process whereby all of the sort of sufficient arms were twisted to get these various sort of right rogue states to join. Um, <laughs> were re re fairly duplicitous and we'll yeah. get onto them kind of thing a very classic um, just on rhode island very classic i like that they were like listen up rhode island if you don't sign on to this we're gonna make providence part of another state yeah. <laughs> it's like you can't do that yeah. they're like yeah, we're providence gonna was you. ready to secede <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's like ah my favorite state of rhode island which is nothing and then there's providence it's yeah. just like okay yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. um the paper money stuff i did a bit of research on because i didn't really understand it and it was literally just that a bunch of people had fallen into debt and there was just a lack of currency going around. So there was just actually physically no way for you to pay your debts. Okay. So they wanted banks and governments to actually like issue more money. But as soon as they would issue this money, because the governments were in extreme amounts of debt, they give the people this money and then they would pay off their creditors and the value of the paper money would just immediately drop. So that's the reason that like these federalists, quote unquote, money lenders, people like that were against paper money was because... They would get paid back, but then it would just next week it would drop like 40, 70 percent, right? So it's like they weren't actually getting paid back. They're really just losing money. So they wanted to be paid in like gold coin, silver, stuff that's backed, right? And that's why you get, I think it's like, uh, well, I don't actually remember which part of the Constitution it is. But there's a section in the Constitution that specifically says no states can issue money. You can't do that anymore. So this is just like a huge slap in the face, right, to all of the debtors out there. And debt was an enormous problem back then because it's just like you can no longer exercise what little political control you have on your local 
you know, courthouse or state government or whatever, even if there are states where they have a paper money party, a populist party in power, they can't do anything about it. The only people who can are us. And ho ho, it, the federal government happens to literally just be federalists. So, you know, what are you going to do? One of the things that really interested about his reading of the Constitution is it's like, yes, it's a really simple and straightforward document, but you can also show how everything in it mm. is designed to solve a very specific economic problem that is the concern of the founders. And as you say, one of the things he does say is that, like, it puts very few stipulations on uh, what state... Well, it gives very few powers. It gives only the powers that it needs to give to the central government kind of thing. But it also puts very few stipulations on what the states can do. And one of them is... Um, is the yeah not allowed to issue its own currency? I think the other one is something to do with trade. It's not the the states aren't yeah. allowed to engage in, uh, in treaties, in as well. treaties and uh, um, trade, which kind of brings us onto one of our other interests, right? Mm. Which is the sort of capitalist slash mercantile merchant classes who are being disadvantaged disadvantaged in various ways. Like obviously they want a strong state to be put in place to put in place all these trade deals, but also to, I think to dissolve some of the trade barriers between the various states. Mm. And I think there's also a lot of like foreign imports that are coming in and sort of like, um, it's impossible for the local uh, manufacturing and capitalist classes to compete against all mm. of these sort of foreign imports. So they also want these, a strong state that will put in place trade tariffs and barriers to strengthen the local internal American economy against all of these um, cheap imports. So cheap it's, another, it's, another, imports. it's another, yeah, exactly. It's another place <laughs> in which like the the poorer classes are being advantaged because there are all these cheaper imports that they can take advantage of, mm. um, and the the rich nascent capitalist class wants to take these away, yeah. and they see their route to that being achieved as being the institution of a new constitution and a stronger mm. federal state kind of thing. And we saw this in the founder as well. You're absolutely right, because it wasn't really until like a couple decades after the constitution was written that you really started to see an actual industrial like uh, manufacturing interest really start to grow and actually have manufacturing towns and stuff like that in the north of the uh, of the states. And also, I guess, yeah, finally, we should talk about the land speculators, mm -hmm. more speculators. Basically, what would happen is when the king, Mad King George, Dan, when he would open up new lands for settlement, and this is another thing, another reason for the Revolutionary War is because, and you do learn about this in school, it's because they didn't really want to open up much land west of, like, Appalachia to um, settlement, partially because there were treaties already in place. Not that, like, the British were famous for, like, keeping treaties, but with, like, the Native American populations, partially it's because it would have been too hard to control and tax. But anyway... When lands were actually opened up, like a famous example of this is in Virginia, you would think, ho, 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 now the common person can go down to Virginia, buy up some really cheap land and live the life. But what actually wound up happening is a bunch of speculators went down there because they had the capital to do this and just bought up all of the land and then sold it at a way higher markup to people. Or they would say, sure, you can pay the same price that it was, but then you'll just be in debt to me forever. So one of the reasons they wanted this strong federal government was to basically, you know, make it so that collecting debts was easier, and again, make it so that people would pay back in a currency of their choosing. Um, not, yeah, not great. Mm -hmm. I mean, who would have thought that like land colonization in America and settling was like a gross issue, but hey, yeah, it was, what are you gonna do? Yeah, I think one of the things that the the Congress of the, com the Confederacy, is that right? No, <laughs> the guys. Like, there's a few times in this where he talks about a confederacy and I'm like, yeah, yeah, what are yeah. we talking about? <laughs> no, we're talking about the Articles of Confederation and the, the government that existed <laughs> under that. We've not jumped forward in time 60 or 70 years. But what was I saying? One of, the, <laughs> one of the ways in which they were paying off their debt was allowing for... They were basically giving giving people land in exchange for these securities mm. notes that they'd issued kind of thing. So there were a lot of people trading in this ostensible government debt for... Um, western lands i suppose and i think also there was at the, the time there was sort of ostensible ownership of this land by people but they couldn't actually productively do anything with it yet mm -hmm. partly because of like um the threat of the the native peoples that live there yeah. <laughs> and the threat that they posed to colonization i think also some threat of like people going out and squatting that land and there was no way to enforce particular ownership over the particular ownership kind of thing mm. and it sort of brings us back to what some of the things that are in the constitution and one of the things that they did was give the new uh, federal government total control over raising an army mm. um and one of the reasons why this was so attractive to lots of the people that supported the federal cause was that like having a central army would then allow for the state to go out and sort of like uh, colonize yeah. This space and make it safe for these speculators to then actually go and do something with mm. um, 
uh, with that land. Yeah. And same with slave owners, too, Quite. because they were like, you know, everyone was freaking the fuck out about, you know, possible slave rebellions or just slave rebellions that were actually happening. And he makes a point that he, where he was like, you know, one of the reasons there might not have been a huge uproar from a lot of like slave plantation owners once, even if they were kind of anti-federalist, once the federal government, and the constitution got put into place was because they could kind of sleep a little bit better being like, actually, we can call upon a national militia to come down here if things ever got too out of control. Which is gross. Yeah. I mean, it comes to this distinction between like having an army to fight domestic yeah. as well as uh, foreign threats. And one of those foreign threats for the South is the prospect of like uh, uh, slave rebellion. Mm. And then also looming over this whole story is uh, Shays' Rebellion in yeah. Massachusetts, which was basically a rebellion by all of these sort of like indebted people who couldn't afford to pay their debtors back. Um, and were represented in this sort of anti-federalist camp who were in favor of the, of the institution of paper money, I suppose. Mm. So yeah. There's a lot of times when um, the various people that he's quoting got, talk about Shays Rebellion in seeming quite grandiose terms, actually, as being this real threat to... Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They marched all around Massachusetts. Yeah, I know. And whenever they went, they would get, like, local town councils to, like, be like, hey, right on, we're on board with you. So I can imagine if you were, like, one of these schmucks living in Boston, you'd be a little bit like, whoa. Yeah. This isn't great. Um, I think that does bring us nicely. I think we should talk about what we've been kind of teasing about how the Constitution actually was ratified because it's extremely comical. And to kind of bring us on when we're talking about the South and slave plantations, Georgia was a really interesting example of like pe the people who voted at the Constitutional Convention to ratify this document because Georgia was so kind of like enthralled with fighting back against Native American, I'm not going to say incursions, obviously, <laughs> but like wars, mm. right? That Assertions they, of their right to live yeah, on the land that they live in. Yeah. Just live in. Um, that they were basically like, there was no time for them to think about this. They were just like, we can get more troops? Sure. And he gives this, again, another part of the book where he lists each state and he says what happened in each state. But um, he gives a lot of really nuanced, interesting ways in which the Federalists were able to organize and how they did it. And I think that perhaps... If you're one of these neocouts out there, this is maybe the most useful part of the entire book because he gives you a real lesson in politicking and how politics like actually work because like we'll get into who was able to vote to like send these people and who these people were that went to the conventions here in a sec. But like this was just a crash course in here's a political agenda I want to get pushed through. I'm going to do it in the quickest way possible. You know, we're not we're not going to publicize it a whole lot, except for in the areas where we want people to know where we have a strong federalist uh, backing and we're just going to do it, dude. And one of the hilarious things that they did was, and I think Pennsylvania, um, the anti-federalists who were there to like vote, you know, Pennsylvania is like, we're not going to ratify the Constitution or whatever. The anti-federalists didn't show up to this debate, so they couldn't have a quorum. So the federalists couldn't basically ratify the Constitution in Pennsylvania. And so what the Federalists did, and this rocks, and I kind of respect <laughs> it, is literally just go to these people's hotel rooms and houses with mobs, rip these people out of their beds, just shove them in the courthouse, lock the doors, and go, we have a quorum, we're voting on it, we did it. And that's literally how it happened in Pennsylvania. It's just like, oh my God. I respect that. That's yeah. good politics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the things, yeah, one of the things that was in my mind whilst I was reading this book was this question of like, was the transition from uh, uh, Articles of Confederation to federal state and the institution of the Constitution, was it just a natural process that was mm. like bound to happen as the sort of history unfolds, you know, and this sort of process of progress? Yeah. Was it the movement towards the sort of natural growth into a state which was fit for this age, I suppose? And maybe there are some elements of that, but really the story is the Federalists were so much better organized. And as you say... Le leverage that to their advantage right like everything was hurried through like the dissemination of information was very tactical obviously they were they were very lucky in some respects right because um a lot of the people that would be opposed to this were prevented from um either voting or being elected by virtue of their not having the property requirements in the various states to be an elector because all of the different states employed different rules around who gets to vote and what have you yeah. But then also a lot of the, all of the Federalists were kind of located in cities and all of the people that were going to be opposed to it were rurally based or it was much more difficult to get information, particularly if there was no interest in actually passing that information on. Yeah. Um, and so sort of like constructing very small pockets of electors who are going to vote the right way that you want 
um, in these uh, elections and processes of ratification, which were, as you say, hurried and also took place, uh, most of them across the winter of 78, mm. 77, 78 kind of thing. So actually getting bothering to go out and vote and take part in this process was like um, very laborious if anybody mm. actually had an interest in doing it. And a lot of people were just apathetic to the whole yeah, process. Exactly. Um, and he puts a lot of effort into trying to work out how many people actually voted mm. in these various... So basically what happened was they the the framers of the constitution said okay if we want to ratify this thing all of the states need to hold their own conventions it's not for the state legislatures to ratify this constitution it's for Classic. specific specific um new electors need to be elected to vote on this ratification process which was i think it was it was part of that that process was part of this tactical uh, strategic process also because like they knew that they had opposition in the the state legislatures in various of the states, but if they there was a specific election to elect people to ratify or not the mm. constitution, then they could they could um, mess with that a bit. Mess with that process, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so yeah, and the number of people that seem to have elected out of the el eligible electors seems to be tiny minorities. You know, it seems to be like well, two or three percent of the entire population seems to have voted in certain states. Literally. And it's like four fifths of the eligible electors didn't even yeah. know or didn't even turn out or didn't actually have any interest or were apathetic or didn't have sufficient information. Yeah, didn't know. So it was just, yeah, it just it seems like p part sort of like clown show, part <laughs> very intentional anti-democratic process. Mm. So you think about this sort of like lauded sacred text and actually the process by which it was instituted was incredibly messy and one of the things he likes to put he seems to point out several times is it's not even clear in quite a few of these states whether a majority of the people that actually voted voted yeah. for um, ratification of the constitution because they were voting for electors who ostensibly were going to vote in a certain way but then seemingly a lot of them got to this various um, meetings and then voted or was persuaded to vote in ways which they hadn't actually been elected to. So there were quite a few states where a majority of people voted against ratification, but ratification still seemed to happen. Yeah. So. Well, and also there literally was no popular vote ever on whether or not they wanted to get rid of the Articles of Confederation. Yeah. They just were like, we're going to do this. Are yeah, you yeah. in or not? And everyone was like, okay, I guess. <laughs> I guess this is happening. <laughs> yeah. He gives two stats just to say to what, to speak to what you're saying. He says that three quarters of all enfranchised people in this process didn't vote. And so when we say enfranchised people, that's no women, that's no slaves, that's no Native Americans, obviously, and it's like no one who's young. So it's literally just like white and adult and non property people. Yeah, people. literally, exactly. So just like three quarters of that small part of the population didn't bother voting. And then he says that one sixth of those people voted to ratify it. So it's just like this incredibly undemocratic, which classic America. It's this incredibly undemocratic process that is just like, it's almost beautiful that that is what started the country because it's just like, what else would have started it? You know, this like mass democratic uprising? Give me a break. So it sucks. Um, I suppose we should also maybe get into what's actually in the constitution a yep. bit and about how people are elected and the legislatures and all of this. Again, Dan, when you're in school in America, checks and balances, it's this incredible idea that a bunch of people a long time ago came up with and the system works perfectly. And it's like, why did abortion just get outlawed? And it's, don't worry about that. It's <laughs> checks and balances. So if we start with the first of the three branches, which I guess we'll just say the legislative branch, as we all know, in the federal government split into the House of Representatives and the Senate. So the House of Representatives is supposed to be the one thing that is like democratic, right? It's the one thing that is directly elected by people, more or less one person, one vote, and that's like the people's body, right? Except we all know that because of gerrymandering, that isn't actually true. You get like some insane right-wing nut job in like the middle of like a relatively nominally progressive place because his district looks like a snake or something, right? And then the Senate, and I did not actually know this. We all know that the Senate is stupid now because it's, you know, like Wyoming gets two senators and California gets two senators. I didn't actually realize that up literally until 19, I think like 13, it might have actually been the year this book was written, which is kind of funny. Senators were not elected by people. They were chosen by state legislatures. I had no idea about that. That like drove me fucking nuts. And it drove me nuts that that wasn't changed until like 1913. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> what? So that's the legislative branch. Those are the people writing the laws. Yeah. We all know how insane the executive branch is, electing the president. They intentionally made it so that it was like electors. It's this really complicated process where 
you tell, you register your preference to an elector who represents a weird group of people and they ostensibly are supposed to go and vote for that, but they don't have to, which we've seen before, classic. And as we've seen recently, popular vote does not always win because of this insane system. And then finally, there's the most undemocratic thing of all time, which is the judicial branch, which like they outwardly say this is to check the power of the majority. They were obviously all really worried. I mean, of course, these people aren't elected. They serve for life. They wear wizard robes, which is just a slap in the face. They're all saying we don't want any kind of factional majority to have like out uh, outweighed importance in government. And you kind of take that to mean, okay, the manufacturers don't want the like slave owner, like, you know, rice field owner plantation guys to have out motive. But then you literally keep reading and Madison or somebody will explicitly say this is to guard against the landless proletariat. And it's just like, oh my God, I'm going to rip my hair out. It's crazy because they literally say, they're all saying, wow, these like urban dwelling propertyless people, that's who we got to look out for. And that's why we have to set up the system like this. It's just like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you look at the way they very deliberately constructed it so that like um, it's two years term for the House of Representatives, <laughs> six years term for the Senate. There was a, a, like four years for the president and lifetime service for the Senate. And very intentionally designed so that there couldn't be any sort of popular movement that could mm. overturn the entire system very rapidly it's it's a it's a system that's designed to be conservative slowly change uh, as well as like the process for ratifying the constitution being incredibly yeah. laborious <laughs> yeah. and difficult to achieve so yeah and one of the one of the things that is discussed at length in this a discussion that was had at the time was are we going to institute some kind of property qualifications for being able to vote in these various elections mm. and for various reasons one they couldn't quite work out what kind of property qualifications they would put in place that would <laughs> advantage the people they wanted to advantage and yeah. disadvantage the people they wanted to disadvantage kind of thing they just couldn't work out who what kind of peculiar arrangement of property qualifications would be allowed would allow you to vote kind of thing and the reason why they settled on not having that was just like the actual structure is so opaque and difficult yeah, and like, anti-democratic in the first place. We don't need to make it more <laughs> anti-democratic. And they what, said that it explicitly. Was, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't any kind of like high-minded democratic ideal that meant that you had like universal manhood suffrage kind yeah. of thing. It was just that it didn't matter because didn't matter the Constitution was so, so such a strong bulwark against any type of change. And you're, you're right to bring up this idea of the like landed proletariat like that is their very very explicit concern i think it's it is james madison or something it's just like obsessed with the idea of putting down mm. this majority and it, there's a section of this where he talks about um madison's political theory in quite um quite a lot of detail and it starts out and you're kind of like, OK, this is I was sort of falling into the kind of like mm. liberal brain reading of the Constitution <laughs> that it's the sort of like divinely inspired, high minded philosophical texts, what have you, because it's talking in a very kind of like pluralistic way. You know, it's designed to balance all interests. And then he starts to talk about like. Um, preventing any majority from coming about that's going <laughs> to dominate everybody else. And then you realise what he actually means by a majority is just like exactly that, the, land, the, the landless proletariat <laughs> rising up and through what we would imagine to be purely legitimate democratic means, <laughs> infringing upon property rights. And they're in incredibly explicit that the constitution is written to protect property rights and that whenever they seem to be talking pluralistically about various different interests it's all these various different interests there is various different property interests that we've been talking about through this that they're seeking to balance the interests of there's no there's no like inclusion of the sort of the democracy. majority <laughs> yeah or democracy <laughs> in any of this which puts the 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 constitution of the united states in a very specific context obviously I mean, it's obvious what that context is, but it's worth reiterating that it was yeah. entirely designed to protect private property against the interests of the propertyless uh, majority or the masses. And they will just come out and say that in the Federalist. Yeah. It's like, who are you giving the Federalist yeah. to? Where they're like, right on. And it's like, I guess <laughs> it's just his friends. Like, they will literally say, we are doing this to protect private property against debtors. Yeah. Like, there's some insane quote from the first Chief Justice where he's like, look at all of these... Uh, common people who like view with tenderness the cause of the debtor and it's like 
it, it couldn't be more obvious that these people are just getting their pockets lined. Mm. They're like, they don't care. They don't care at all. And it's funny because, yeah, you can't blame them because they're just acting in their economic best interest. But it's like, man, you're being so blatant about it. Yeah. It's like, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Bastards. we have today, like, liberals and leftists who speak very high-mindedly yep. of the U.S. Constitution and celebrate yep. it and think that it can be amended to sort of advantage the core, the progressive cause, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I really, all this has done is sort of like cement and reinforce my anti anti-constitutional <laughs> outlook by just saying that the construction of um, the U.S. state, but also the British state, is just designed to advantage uh, capitalist interests. Yeah. Um, and if we want to have a truly free and liberated state, we're going to have to have a new constitution and new constitutional arrangements and yeah. um, truly demo a truly democratic process of actually choosing the political structure of the countries in which we live, which yeah. we haven't ever had. <laughs> yeah, literally. And it's, yeah, I don't know. It's insane. Part of me is like, wow, this is actually really useful because it's like, if they did it, we can do it, you know? But it's like, well, we're not making this under our own, the conditions of our choosing, right? And it's like, what are the odds that we could have a new constitutional convention and tear all of this stuff down? And it's like, zero, <laughs> basically. Like, I hate to say it, it is basically zero that that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But it is really worth seeing how a, like, bourgeois revolution took place. It took place in very, like, in concrete terms. It's uh, it's inspiring, but it's also pretty, like, I don't know, it's defeating. I, on one hand, you want to be like, if somehow you could get enough people elected and keep this momentum going, you could abolish the Senate, abolish the executive branch, completely rework the judiciary, and just expand the House of Representatives to, like, one person, one vote, and that's it, immediately recallable, all of this stuff. But it's like, these... This is just a real... Like, I don't know, if you want a good structuralist reading of why that might not be super easy or and or possible, like read this, don't read Alpha or you know what I mean? Just like literally read this. And it's like, it is designed to be impossible. So I think if you're one of these people who's maybe putting all of your hopes in electoralism, which I don't think any like serious, like communist is, um, yeah, you know, think again. <laughs> because these people certainly didn't when they were making their revolution and their mm -hmm. like bourgeois mm -hmm. party and state. So, you know. Yeah, you're really right to depict this process as a revolutionary process. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the Civil War as being a revolutionary process. Yeah. It's this transfer of power from the Articles of the Confederation to the US Constitution. As you say, some guys just decided that they were <laughs> going to have to have a... Uh, a new constitution and there was no democratic process that even said yes this is what we want to <laughs> yeah. have happen and then once they all got together this cabal of people who had these very particular set of interests wrote a constitution that directly advantaged them and then what they did was circumvent all of the pre-existing laws that were written into the articles of confederation that says it's for the states to decide whether changes are going to be ratified or not. They were like, no, actually, the process we're going to do is we're not going to let state legislatures do it. We're yeah. actually going to just create some new body that's going to decide whether this is going to be ratified. And there's a lot of discussion in this book about that being a revolution. And the various sort of ideologues of this process, James mm. Madison, whoever, like writing extensively about how no, 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 this isn't revolution. Like, but he's he's like there. Are, there are people in this who are like, if this is some other, in some other context, it would be described as a coup d'état because yeah, totally. that is what they do. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just because it's relatively bloodless process of like, yeah, and because they're existing in a state of like political limbo kind mm. of thing, like there there was a lot of uncertainty anyway. They were able to just like slip these things through this process but, yeah. and we, we don't we don't exist in that situation now right like yeah the u.s constitution unfortunately is heavily cemented into the mythos of the united states and it's sort of like political traditions and mm. um getting around that yeah will be a long and laborious task of propaganda plus all the ways in which the u.s constitution is very evidently failing mm. um the democratic system of yeah. the united states but. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because like so much of it, it seems like is you want to just be like, it's just ideology. It's these fucking dipshits who drive around in their cars with like the Second Amendment thing on the back of their car and we the people on their T-shirts and who would fetishize the Constitution in a sexual way, not in a communist <laughs> way, might I say. But then it's also the libs. Just who getting whipped by the Constitution. Yeah, literally, exactly. <laughs> but it is also like when we read the, we've done a, a couple of Mike Davis things and I forget exactly which one it was. The New Rights Road to Power, I yeah. think, where he's basically doing this exact study of history, but for how the New Right, Reagan, and all those people came to power. And I mean, it's not just ideological. It's like this system still works in the way that it was supposed to, right? Not as Maybe not as well or anything, but like it still is able to 
chaotically balance the different interests of different factions of the bourgeoisie. And then Mike Davis, he was talking about there were like the real estate people and the defense contractors. And then this new kind of Californian ideology like yuppie tech groups who were like, maybe we'll actually put our uh, weight behind the Democrats. And it's interesting because I mean, like, I suppose you're never ever going to be able to get to that singularity where there aren't any conflicts in the bourgeoisie. There is always going to be this inherent kind of like difference of interests in capitalism within that class. Um, and so maybe history will one day, maybe hopefully rhyme when there's like a questioning of actual sovereignty and of power where we're able to organize our class like they organize their class interests to um, go in quick and take power. But we'll see. Yeah. It's big, yeah, I feel well, like there is a parallel between this text and the Mike Davis uh, in that they sort of describe how to have a strategy of gaining hegemony. Mm. And it's kind of through a process whereby your opponent is so thoroughly left behind by the whole thing yeah. that they don't even know what you're doing or what's happening kind of thing. Like if you look at the rise of the new right, all of the new tactics they were implementing, they so thoroughly outmaneuvered um, any sort of opposed progressive force kind of thing mm. which is very similar to what's happening here right like you have one very active force that knows what it's doing and through apathy and ignorance and ideology and disinterest or whatever uh they managed to outmaneuver their opponents and yeah. so i don't know if we're going to develop some kind of left-wing strategy of gaining a new hegemony mm. perhaps it needs to look something like that although um, which it's I a mean, daunting task it is daunting but i mean like it's it's uh it's refreshing to be able to realize that like maybe there is something to this whole thing about the believing in the working class. You know what I mean? Because it's like, just look to where the interests are that could outmaneuver in a way that you're saying in a radically unrecognizable way to take power. Like the working class is the only really thing right now I think that can do that for the better, right? Because the ways in which it would organize, you know, outside of necessarily like bourgeois political constructs, if it were to be done well and all at once, it would radically overwhelm the existing power structure because it would just be too it wouldn't be something that they could deal with because it's not bourgeois enough it's not recognizable just like the new right kind of left all of the like libs in the dust by just doing like brand new things like the inherent i think like class tendency of the working class speaks to the possibility of that to change the world for the better i hope one of these days it would be nice to see it happen come the next revolution you know hey i'm all for it but um i hope we might be about to end on a high. On a high! <laughs> Look at that. We will do it. Um, this rocked. I really like this. Yeah, um, yeah. Was, I'm really glad we've read it. It's definitely like mm. put this history in a context um, and our present in a context, which yeah. I didn't have um, have before. So having exactly. the context. It is uh, very enlightening, very illuminating. Um, it should go down as a canonical text. As a canonical text, in indeed. The, uh, the restatements. I feel like there are only like two things we've read where, we've been, where we haven't said that. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so read this book, and there are several chapters you can skip. <laughs> Yeah, where he just um, presents all his evidence. And read just read the, the conclusions <laughs> when he lists the people. Read the ones about Hamilton. Read the ones about Madison. Madison is just. I, I think that was the only one that I read. The Madison one. He, I didn't. I don't understand Madison because it's like he wasn't one of these security personal processes guy. He owned a slave plantation that had a bunch of slaves. It's like, bro, what you, you don't? What you're doing doesn't even make sense. Yeah, I don't know. Real piece of shit that guy. And read the Washington ones because the Washington ones. He classically comes across like a fool. They're they're really, really good. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's Gore Vidal in his book on Aaron Burr who talks about how everybody always thinks that Washington was a really bad general but a really good politician. And he flips on his head and he's like, actually, he was a dog shit politician and he was a really good general. It's kind of like more to, is what's being spoken about in this book. But um, as you say, read it. It is very good. Um, and uh, we're off to watch Hamilton. Dan, I, so we're going to go do it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, uh, that's something I think I'll never realistically I've never, I'll never, I've never see. seen Hamilton I'll never see a clip of it if it comes on as a song I've never heard any of the songs just, yeah no good yeah. this is a decidedly so our next episode will not be a review of Hamilton <laughs> well unfortunately okay. this is a decidedly pro Aaron Burr podcast <laughs> he attempted to become emperor of like some breakaway state in America we are all for that that is cool what they did in this book not cool what he did cool Okay. We like that. I don't know anything about this, so you'll have to tell me about it in a minute when we turn off the mic. <laughs> All right, we'll be back uh, in the next time, in two weeks probably, with some more stuff. We got good stuff on the way. Um, it's gonna be excellent. It is gonna be the Great best. Stuff. The best. The best. The best. I I am gonna leave some time. Okay. <laughs> yes, it's another very warm, very humid day in the rainy aisle. 
So yeah, thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you, Jack. Ooh. It's been a pleasure once again. Yeah, we'll see you next time. See you next time. The music you heard this episode was "Music to Kill Bad People" too by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. If you like this song, you can check it out and much, much more on their Bandcamp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com. Be sure and follow us up on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you like what you heard, be sure and tune in next week for some more commie discussion. Till next time.